Good evening. Welcome to our worship service. Welcome also to those who are joining us online. It's good to have you with us today. We're going through the season of Lent, and uh, today we're going to see in our readings how God is serious about what he says in his word. Uh, we're going to have a reading that focuses on, on the commands that he gave to the Israelites, the Ten Commandments that, that we also strive to keep. Uh, we're going to see how what Jesus says happens in our gospel reading. And in our sermon, we're going to see that it's the message of the word, the message of the cross, that is really uh, what shows God's wisdom and power in, in comparison to, to what the world would look at and call wisdom and power. So that's what we'll be considering in our, our sermon today. And uh, we'll continue, or we'll begin with our opening hymn, To Your Temple I Draw Near. And may God bless our worship together this weekend. Please stand. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. i 
Almighty God, look with favor on your humble servants and stretch out the right hand of your power to defend us against all our enemies. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson this weekend is written for us in Exodus chapter 20. This is the account of God giving his people the Ten Commandments. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of our God. We'll continue by singing together Psalm 19. We'll do that responsibly. declare the glory of God. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words for the ends of the world. Lord, you have the words of The law of the Lord is perfect, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. They are more precious than gold. They are sweeter than By them is your servant taught. In keeping them there is great reward. Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. May the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my Redeemer. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in
We will continue with our children's message for today. Kids who are watching online, gather around, take a look. What do I have here? Lots of cleaning supplies. Yeah, we've got the mop and the bucket. We've got some Windex for cleaning glass. We've got surface cleaner, disinfectant, and some brushes to help us clean anything that we might need to. Rags in there, too. Sometimes it's good to get the chance to clean things that are dirty, right? You want things to look nice, and these are the tools that help us to do that. Sometimes you need the right tool for the right job, or all the time, right? So you use the mop on the floor. You use the uh, concentrated soap maybe to put in your water so that when you're mopping the floor, it cleans up the messes. You use glass cleaner for glass. You use surface cleaner for other surfaces. It's important to use the right tools. We see in our gospel reading for today that Jesus also had to do a little bit of cleaning. We're going to hear the story about how he drives people out of the temple who are misusing the place for their own ends. And so he, he even twists together a whip and he, he drives the people out of there. Because what he wanted people to know was that God is serious about his word. He wanted his temple to be used in a certain way. And Jesus was trying to help them to understand that. So he had to clean the place up. But Jesus doesn't only have concern for the temple that was there in, in Jerusalem. He's also got concern for each and every one of us. Because there's an, another temple that God speaks of, and that's the temple that's inside of us. God calls us his temple. And maybe there's a little bit of cleaning that needs to happen there too, right? Because we've got sin in our hearts, and sin should never be in the temple of our God. So, boys and girls, we can think about what, how are we going to clean that out? You need the proper tools, right? And Jesus gives us those tools. He shows us himself. He's the only one that can clean out the mess that's in our hearts, right? And he did that. He did that by living a perfect life in our place. He did that by dying on the cross. And he continues to drive the sin out of our lives by talking to us in his word and encouraging us to, to say no to the sinful things, the bad things, and, and say yes to the things he would have us do instead. So let's clean out our hearts. Let's focus on the only tool that's going to help us to do that, which is the word of God. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for giving us the tools we need to clean out our hearts. Thank you for, for living and dying for us to, to win our forgiveness and salvation. Thank you for giving us your word to continue to encourage us to do as you would have us do and to, to strengthen our faith in you. We pray in your name. Amen. We continue with our verse of the day. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. We continue with the reading of our gospel, written for us in John chapter 2. This is the account of Jesus cleansing the temple. But we also see that he's serious about the word that he himself speaks, because at the end we see him predict his own resurrection and hear that it is fulfilled. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. 
To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of our Lord. We'll continue with our sermon hymn, Lift High the Cross. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, when the world thinks of wisdom and power, what kinds of things does it think of? I'll just give you a couple seconds to, to think in your own minds. What, what do you think they would come up with when they're looking for wisdom, when they're looking for power. On the wisdom side, maybe they look to science, right? All the different ways that we can advance our technology, stave off uh, uh, disease and death. Maybe some people look to that as wisdom. Maybe some people look to Important leaders of, uh, who, who, who uphold morality and, and tell you how you should live your life, 
like the Dalai Lama pictured there. Maybe that's what people look to for wisdom. Maybe people look to things in nature for wisdom. They look at the stars. There's the constellations that make up the zodiac in that picture. Maybe people go to their, their daily horoscopes and, and look to that and to find what's, what's the wisdom that I need for today to get through my life. On the power side of things, what might they look at? Maybe they look at military might, right? All the, the technology that goes into play there, the, the soldiers, instruments of, of warfare. Maybe they look to money. Because money can buy you whatever it is that you want. Or maybe, maybe they look to influence those people that have authority and control over others. Maybe those are the things that, that they look to for power. And people want these things. They want wisdom. They want power. They want to figure out how life is supposed to work. They want to have control over their life. But unfortunately, what we're going to see is that none of the answers that the world provides actually satisfy. None of them provide the answers that we need or the control that we yearn for over life. Fortunately, though, there is a place that we can look for those things. We can look to our God. We can look to his wisdom. We can look to his power. And in the words before us, what we're going to see is that God shows us his wisdom and power, but in a very unexpected way. He shows us his wisdom and power in the message of the cross, of his son, Jesus Christ, and in him crucified. That's where we find all the wisdom that we will ever need, that's where we find power at work for us. And so our theme for today, the message of the cross is the wisdom and power of God. We're turning to the book of 1 Corinthians in the New Testament, chapter 1, verses, sorry, 18 to 25, that should say. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. This is the word of our God. As we talk about these words, we're going we're gonna to break it really into two categories. We're going to talk about wisdom and power. So we'll start with wisdom. People really yearn to know answers to life's tough questions, right? Whether or not they, they want to admit that or not, everybody is, is interested in answers to questions like these. Okay? Who am I? Is there a God? What's my purpose? And what happens when I die? Important questions for, for all of us to consider, and questions that people try to answer with the wisdom that the world has to offer. Because 
God has answers to those questions, but when people look to them, they, they see the, those answers as foolishness. And that's what Paul mentions there. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Because they, they hear the things that God says, and it just doesn't make any sense. For example, you've heard this phrase, right? There is no such thing as a free lunch. Growing up in this world or existing in this world, we've all become accustomed to this idea that if you're going to get something, you've got to work for it. You've got to put in the effort. And yet, God says to us that salvation is free. That there's nothing that you need to do in order to earn his favor. But people hear that and it just goes right over their heads. How could such a thing be possible? There's no such thing as a free lunch. And so it sounds like foolishness to them. Going on from there, they, they can also reason uh, a couple things out as they hear what God says to them. They know that God is a just God, right? It makes sense that if, if someone does something wrong, that there's going to be a punishment to pay for that. And yet, when they see what God says to them, they see something different. They see that God says he punishes the innocent one because he punished his son. And he says, by punishing his son, somehow we're all free of punishment. That doesn't make sense to us. Even worse is this idea that God sacrifices his own son to save people? Who would do such a thing? Who would sacrifice their own child? That doesn't seem like the act of a loving God, the world says. That seems like foolishness and, and stupidity and, and stupidity and atrocity. It seems like the act of a madman. So no, God's wisdom doesn't make sense to the world. So instead, they turn to other things. They, they turn to things like science for their solutions. They turn to, to philosophy, thinking, well, we, we can think our way through this. We can think our way through life and figure out what's going to help us to live our lives so that we can be at peace in this world. Or maybe they turn to various religions and non-Christian ones are, are the ones that we have in mind here. Because really there's only two religions in the world. There's the right one and there's all the rest. And the big difference between those two religions is this. That the true religion, the religion that God gives to us, tells us that there's nothing that we need to do. And all the other religions of the world that you can find out there tell you the opposite. That it's up to you. If you want something good after this life, then you better put in the effort in this life to make sure that happens. That's all that human wisdom has to offer us. And it's no good. And God tells us that it's no good. You hear what Paul says? We're going to go back to these words again. Here's what Paul says about the, what God thinks of the wisdom of the world and what he does to it. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate and that happens, right? I mean, people pursue these other things, the worldly wisdom, but what do they find? It doesn't end in happiness for them. They don't find any real solutions that, that are going to calm their conscience. No, God frustrates the worldly wisdom. So where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world. He shows that none of these things are going to work. And then Paul says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. And we'll leave the thought hanging there. That's why God frustrated the wisdom of the world. He had a plan, you see. He had a plan to show the world that none of these things work, that none of these things are going to enable 
people to get to know God as he really is. He did that because he wanted to show us himself. He wanted to share his wisdom with us so that we could get to know him that way. And that's exactly what God does for us. Those tough questions that people want answers to, God has answers to them all, doesn't he? Think about it. Who am I? God tells us who we are. He says, you're a redeemed child of God, bought by Jesus' blood. That's your identity. Not husband or father or wife or mother or son or daughter. Not worker, employer, or employee. Those are part of our identity, sure. Responsibilities that we hold, maybe. Roles. But it's not who we really are. And how comforting it is to know who we really are. A child of God. Bought with the blood of his son. Is there a God? Yes. And, and not some hostile God, but a God who loves you more than anything else. You are precious to him. What's my purpose? God tells us that too. He says our purpose is to glorify him in all that we do. And that's something that we're all still working on. Something that we do imperfectly now in this world. Yep, it is what we strive for. And it's what God enables us to do, what he helps us to do. That's our purpose in everything. And so if we're waking up and we're wondering, oh, what should I do today? Let our thoughts go to this. Glorify God. In whatever tasks God has given me to fulfill this day, may I glorify him in all of them. That's our purpose. And what happens when I die? That's when real life begins. Life with our Heavenly Father, with our Savior, and the life that, that God always intended for us. A life of blessedness and joy forever at his side. That's what the wisdom of God says to us. And as we get those answers to those questions, we also see this, that, that all of those answers center in on one person, on one act. And it's Jesus. Jesus and him crucified. Because that's the only way any of those answers are possible it's the only way any of those things make sense. Yeah, we are who we are because Jesus died for us. We have a purpose in life because Jesus died for us. We have a God who loves us based on the fact that Jesus died for us. And we have an eternity at his side waiting for us. Because Jesus died for us. So Christ crucified is God's wisdom. It's his answer to all the problems of this world. It's what defeats sin and Satan and death. Christ, the wisdom of God. And yeah, though it seems foolishness to the world, the fact is, well, God's foolishness, so-called, is way wiser than man's wisdom, as Paul said in that letter, right? So we've talked about wisdom. What about power? We, we threw these pictures up on the screen earlier to talk about what the world thinks of as power. This is what they look to. They want control over their lives. They look to exert influence over others. And any way that they can do that, they'll pursue it. You can think of different leaders of the world. You can think of people in business. You can think of people on, on social media or in, or in Hollywood, right? Exercising their power, trying to get more of it. For what? For a life that finally still ends in death. 
And what have they gained? Really, nothing at all. But they look at Jesus, and what do they see? They see weakness. We're going to say Christ crucified is the power of God, but that's not the way it looks to the world because when they look at Jesus, they see someone the very opposite of what they're used to as far as the concept of power goes. Think of the Jews. Paul Paul said Jews look for signs. They were looking for, for miracles from Jesus to prove that he was who he said he was. Show us that you're the Messiah. Show us that you're the one that God sent. Be a strong military leader for us. Destroy the Romans. Establish a kingdom on earth. (laughs) If they would have seen that, they might have said, okay, that's power. But that's not what Jesus showed them. Jesus didn't come here to, to conquer people's hearts by force. He came with gentleness and meekness. And that can be offensive. It was offensive to the Jews. Maybe it's offensive sometimes to you and me, too. Because we'd like power also, wouldn't we? And Jesus, we're your followers. Doesn't that mean something for us right here, right now? What if, Jesus, what if you put us in charge of things here in this world? Jesus, what if you would give us all the the, the money and wealth of the world so that we could do great things with it for you? Or, Jesus, at least, since, since we're following you, shouldn't our lives be nice and easy and enjoyable all the time? And sometimes we're offended by the apparent weakness of Jesus, too, aren't we? But the truth is, Jesus is anything but weak. Jesus exercised great strength when he came into this world precisely because he did things differently. Like we said, he didn't use brute force when he came. No, he came with a spirit of of love, of, of gentleness, of humility, and finally sacrifice. And doesn't that show really just how strong Jesus is? Because he he knew his father's plan, right? He knew what it was going to take. And any step along the way, he could have said, you know what? Forget this. Let those people die for their own mistakes, their rebellious ways. I'm not going to do that. He took great strength to follow his father's plan to the letter to trust perfectly in him, to show all the way through that love and humility to others, to finally give his life as a sacrifice for your sins and mine. That's the power of Jesus at work for us. So no, Jesus is not weak. And one more point we want to make before we wrap this up, and I'll, I'll ask you a question. Have you heard of this? CRISPR? CRISPR is a, a gene editing process, technology, that's uh, become prominent recently. Won, the, won a Nobel Prize, I think, for, for science or something in, uh, in 2020. But what it enables people to do is to actually edit gene sequences which is pretty amazing and more than a little scary, too. It gives scientists and doctors immense power. I mean, think of it, being able to basically engineer how people are going to grow and develop. But there's something that this technology would never be able to do, and that is change a person's heart. Remove the evil that resides within. That's impossible for a technology like this, but it's not entirely impossible. 
Why so? Back to the beginning of our reading. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. The message of Christ crucified is God's power to change hearts, to change lives. It melts our hearts of stone and, and gives us hearts of flesh, as the Bible puts it elsewhere. It rescues us from sin and death and Satan and puts us on another path, a path where we want to serve God, where we eagerly listen to what he has to say, where we want to imitate Christ and his way of living, the love and the gentleness, the humility and the sacrifice. A message that can do that is the most powerful thing in the world. And it's interesting too, isn't it, that such a powerful message, a powerful tool, hides itself in things so simple. Words. Water connected to those words. Bread and wine connected to those words. And yet, these things are the power of God that change people's hearts, that take care of the problem of sin and and enable us to live at peace in our lives here in this world. Peace with each other and peace with God. Nothing could be more powerful. Nothing could be more wise. So brothers and sisters, yes, the message of the cross is the wisdom and power of God. If we're looking for wisdom and power, let's go no further than Jesus Christ. If we want to tell other people what true wisdom and power is, let's be like Paul and the rest of the Christian church and resolve to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God which transcends all human understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue by confessing our faith together. We'll use the words of the Nicene Creed today. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in who unity with the Father and the, and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with the song of the season. Sin, Christ suffered. 
In our prayers today, we remember uh, the family of Merle Meitner. I have some sad news to share. If you remember, Merle was uh, an emergency teacher here with us a couple years ago, taught the upper grades. Uh, we just learned that he passed away yesterday after having a heart attack. So, so we'll be praying for his family tonight uh, and also giving thanks to God for, for the life he gave him and now the true life that he's experiencing at his side. So please rise for prayer. We'll, we'll thank God for all the blessings that he's given to us. And uh, if you have an offering to give tonight, you may do so in the plates at the back of the room or, or give online. Generous God, over and over, your grace sustains us. Over and over, your love provides for us. Over and over, your arm steadies us. We give you our gifts with gratitude and joy, thankful that you are God over all. Amen. Heavenly Father, because of our sins, we justly deserve to suffer both your curse during our time on earth and your condemnation eternally in hell. But we plead for your mercy because your Son, Jesus, suffered the punishment our sin deserved. For his sake, you have forgiven our sins 
and cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Now, trusting that he will intercede for us, we dare to ask for your blessing. Mercifully provide whatever each of us may need for body and life. Protect us and those we love from all harm and danger. Maintain good government among us and bless all those in authority with wisdom and integrity. Defend us from the devil and the world which would lure us back into the way that leads to eternal death. Destroy in us the desires that are contrary to your will. Comfort the persecuted, the depressed, the sick, and the dying with the assurance that nothing can separate us from your love. Strengthen our faith by the word of your forgiveness and by the sacrament of our Savior's own body and blood. Grant that we may praise you, our merciful God, by showing mercy to others in all their needs. And, O Lord God, Lord of life and death, we thank you for all the mercies with which you blessed our fellow believer, Merle Meitner, now fallen asleep. We thank you especially for having brought him to the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would comfort his family and all who mourn his death with your precious promises and cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant the lifeless body rest, and at last, together with us all, a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved through Jesus Christ, our risen and ever-living Lord. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We commit to your care our bodies and souls and all things because you have purchased us to be your own with the sacrifice of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who also taught us to pray. Our Lord Father, Father in, heaven, in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be, be your, your name. name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come. come. Your, your will, will be done, be done on, on earth as in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us today our daily bread. bread. Forgive, Forgive us our, our sins, sins as we forgive, forgive those who sin against, against us. us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as we conclude with our final hymn.
It's good to be with you here today in God's house, also with those who are with us online. I'm glad to be able to lead you in worship of our God and Savior. Some announcements today, uh, again, on, on Merle's passing, uh, our heart goes out to them. No news yet on uh, when or where the funeral might be, if any of you are interested in that, but we will, as soon as that information becomes available, we'll make that, that known so that people uh, would have the opportunity to attend. Uh, some announcements in the worship folder. A lot of positions available right now that we're, that we're looking to fill, so I'll just point those out to you. We're looking for someone who could be a classroom assistant in the afternoons from on Tuesday through Friday in the third and fourth grade classroom. It'd be from about uh, uh, 12.30 to 3.30, four-ish. So uh, if, if anyone would be interested in that, please let me know uh, or contact our office. Also, a uh, finance manager position is available, and uh, we're looking for somebody who can uh, do the book work, basically, recording expenses and, and helping out our treasurer uh, with the work that he does. Uh, so um, a full job description is available at the office and applications as well. Uh, and then a Vistancia marketing position also we're looking for someone who could spend a number of hours a week doing that and, and being out there at events, taking pictures and so on, and, and then uh, especially doing social media type things. So if you're interested in that, please talk to Pastor Ehlers. Uh, one more announcement to make is our new principal and uh, teachers who will be joining us next year, Drew and Stacy Aguilar, they made the move uh, this, this weekend and we had uh, an unloading crew and unloaded their trucks this morning, uh, got it done in less than an hour, which was amazing. We had that many people, so it was great. So thank you so much to everybody who helped out with that, made for, for light work. Um, they'll be heading back to California after, um, well, tomorrow on Sunday, and uh, they'll finish out the school year, and then they'll be joining us permanently in the summer. So we're thankful uh, that, uh, that stage one is complete, at least, and, and they've got a place to live, and they're, they're, they're the majority of their things are here. Those are the announcements. Uh, we will be celebrating the, the sacrament in just a few moments, so I'll go get ready for that, and, and uh, blessings on, on uh, your week and your day for those who who are uh, leaving before that happens. Mm -hmm. 